Hi, and welcome to Access Chat today. We're delighted to welcome Kevin Carey uh, to to the show. Kevin is a good friend of mine, but he's also the chairman of the RNIP, uh, an engineer, a distinguished uh, person of note in in the world of accessibility. You do loads of different things, Kevin. I can't even reel off all of the things that you get involved in. Um, So... Maybe you could give us a bit more of an introduction about yourself and some of the really interesting stuff that you've been doing in terms of developing new tools to make Braille affordable and and some of the other bits of research that you're doing right now. My quest started out with the inaccessibility of Windows 3.x in the early 1990s when I was living in Kenya and... um, the university only had one server, so poor people were not getting a very good deal out of this. And because it was using graphical user interface, blind people who'd been using DOS editors weren't getting very much good out of it. And the two things came together in me being very interested in the first place about how poor and underprivileged people and disabled people as a whole big group Uh, we're going to deal with the internet or whether they'd be disadvantaged by it. So I didn't start out with a specifically disability angle. I started out with a a social justice angle. And when I came back to the UK, I set up a small not-for-profit that dealt with what was not then called the inclusion but is now um, and decided after a while to turn it into a charity. And we began looking at the way that people access the internet, not not really registered disabled people, but actually that group of people between, let's call the most disabled 10% and the 50% who are comfortable. So I was looking after about 40% of people in a gray area. To that extent, Humanity, the charity I set up, uh, was one of the great pioneers of uh, text messaging. We forecast in the late 90s that text messaging would be fantastic because it meant the people who weren't very good with QWERTY keyboards and the PC bundle would be able to communicate with each other. So uh, that was one of our first kind of breakthroughs. And after that, I began to get very interested in broadcasting, and I began to do work on the accessibility of uh, television and got a Nesta Fellowship in Accessible Broadcasting. And actually, even though I got an arts degree, I got a Royal television society engineering room and even though i had an arts degree i actually got a royal television society engineering award for um trying to do some work on uh speech to text for driving televisions it was a bit premature but it was a lot of fun it was on the sky electronic program guide and after the nesta fellowship i went to work for ofcom on the regulation of accessible television uh, but then I got sort of diverted out of that when I became first the vice chairman, then the chairman of RNIB. So in the last few years, although I've done some work which will come back to on the economics of accessibility, and I've had some other um, sideline interests in the past few years, I've focused mainly on uh, blindness and low vision. Thank you. It's, it's uh, a lot of stuff you've done. And, and obviously, I, I know that uh, I first came across the stuff that you were doing through Gareth Ford Williams. Um, and obviously, you've done some work with Gareth on iPlayer and, and, and the interface there as well. Yeah, I was very keen on broadcasting, um, mainly because although uh, congenitally disabled people, by and large, have grown up with the PC, Windows bundle, and more recently with mobile phones. The vast majority of people who've got some sort of um, physical impairment um, are huge consumers of broadcasting, which is why the first thing I did when I I got interested in technology for the blind was to put a huge amount of effort into making um, television menus accessible. And we actually manufactured a chip and put it into a set-top box at a time when that was still the way you did it. About 2005, RNIB invested 1.5 million quid uh, to manufacture a chip 
so that televisions could menus could be accessible because there's no po point putting audio description onto programs if you can't find the program on the menu. So that was sure. my first big thing in accessibility of RNIB was accessible television. Then, of course, we persuaded uh, Japanese uh, television companies to make their menus accessible. But that was that was the start. Interesting. So <clears throat> I think your cough is passing to me now. Uh, so I know that also you talked about a um, social justice issue. Um, I've been providing assistive tech and assistive hardware for a long time. And some of the most expensive assistive hardware is Braille hardware. And, and I know that, that this is something that energized you uh, and you've been working on, on a project to reduce the cost uh, and therefore make Braille accessible for people around the world. Yeah, the... The first refreshable Braille display I saw was a P80 electric display in 1978. And looking at it again in around about 2008-9, um, it hadn't changed in terms of the technology. And uh, the price had stayed fairly static in real terms, which is huge. I mean, the um, Apex Braille display that I've got with 32 Braille cells uh, was more than $4,000. Sorry, more than £4,000. In America, it would be $4,000. But here, of course, they charge in pounds what they charge in America in dollars. And I made a promise in 2011 on behalf of RNIB that I would cut the price of refreshable Braille by 90%. And I got together all the big players in Work for the Blind all all over the world to pool in one project and uh, we got one and a half million dollars together we wrote a user requirement we tested that with the world blind community we came back we did three iterations of prototyping and um, the unit has just gone into production in well there's a cyclone in Chennai in December but it's just about to go into production and it's $320 for a 20-cell unit, which is really small. What that means is three things. First of all, it puts a refreshable Braille display into the hands of blind people in the West who want to link it up to uh, a Kindle or to an iPhone so that they can read Braille books really cheap. And that also gets RNIB out of having to spend a huge amount of money making Braille books in hard copy, which is horribly expensive. The second thing it does is it allows all libraries all over the planet to distribute a vast number of Braille books on SD cards, uh, which means that you, again, m massively cut the cost of people consuming Braille. The third thing that it does, which is for me the most exciting in many ways, is it puts real Braille into the hands of kids in developing countries where there is no hard copy Braille. They can use Bluetooth on this Orbit 20 reader to download stuff from the internet, as well as being given SD cards um, with Braille on it. And we couple this up with another not so well-known project yet, because it's only just finished, which is that I've also through RNIB, teamed up with Dolphin Systems, and we have just finished producing a very, very simple converter that will turn um, Word files and XML files into large print Braille and synthetic speech with simple architecture. And we're giving that free to anybody who wants it, except for the top 40 countries in the world. And so that will sort of be a a twin to the other thing. So we have cracked uh, Braille hardware, uh, we've cracked Braille software, we've cracked large print, and we've cracked making synthetic speech uh, usable. Okay, and, and you say it, uh, you're making it freely available for the all apart from the top 40 countries. Um, obviously, within those top 40 countries, there are people that still don't have a lot of money. So What's the what's the cost to to an individual to to get hold of this 
software. We didn't, we didn't think of it that way. What we did was we bought a license off Dolphin okay. to, for all but the top 40 countries. But Dolphin okay. have fairly simple browse software. People can go to MVDA and get um, free software. So it isn't like there isn't anything in the market. But I can't solve everybody's problems. This was no, a very no. specific third world problem. No, understand. I just wondered what the, the, the cost was to an individual if they were interested in the solution. So I guess we'll go and ask our friends at Dolphin. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, that, that's fair. Uh, another thing that we, we talk about uh, on a fairly regular basis is how we can look at the problems that are caused by uh, or, or the failure of legislation and uh, governments to actually address inaccessibility and how we might reframe the problem? Well, I think that the interesting thing about regulation is that there have been three notable successes in accessibility in the 21st century, and they've all been driven by regulation. Uh, chronologically, but going on over a long period, the first was the regulation of state broadcasting and broadcasting that's governed by the allocation of spectrum. So if you're looking in the United Kingdom, um, the BBC operates under a broadcasting license, and part of the condition of license is that it must broadcast a certain number of programs that are audio described or that have subtitling or have signage. The commercial channels, in order to get spectrum allocated by Ofcom, also, if they have more than a certain amount of qualifying revenue, have to do um, accessible television. So that's the first thing. Second thing is that um, there's been a success in the movie industry because if one country institutes regulation on audio description, subtitling, and signing for movie distribution in one country in the world, Hollywood might as well do it for all countries in the world because the cost doesn't go up as long as you're sort of doing the accessibility in English. And the third success, of course, was the Apple success of text-to-speech and speech-to-text. Uh, the, particularly the text-to-speech part of it was simply driven by American legislation on the specifications for hardware being sold into the American education system. The problem with getting further is that as long as the disability community frames what it wants in terms of a right of access, that does two things. First of all, it doesn't differentiate between really necessary access for a group of disabled people um, and not very important access. It doesn't look at the social gain, so it puts everything on the on the same level. So, for instance, I'm a totally blind person. Um, I'm going to be far more interested in getting a really accessible website for downloading music than for downloading modern art. I'm not saying no blind person will ever buy a piece of modern art, but the social gain is much lower on the modern art than it is on music. The second thing is that rights are actually not <coughs> totally discreet. I may have a right of access, but somebody holding a copyright has an absolute right over their own copyright. And most commercial organizations in the Western world have, <coughs> excuse me, have a legal obligation to make profit, not to abridge shareholder value. They can only use CSR to increase their profits, not to do good. So when disability organizations lobby commercial organizations to do good, it's totally daft. So what you need is a different approach on both sides. On the one hand, the disability sector has to stop exaggerating its market size. And on the other hand, the commercial sector has to stop either saying that what disabled people want isn't technically possible or saying it's too expensive when they haven't got a clue how much it is. So we actually need a rational discussion around the table which says, look, an optimal product is one that has the maximum set of features whereby if you added a feature or if you took a feature away, profit would go down. Right. Are any of the features disabled people want missing from that? Okay, how much would it cost to add them? 
And all those features so widely used uh, that they present what I call a peer normative problem. Are they so peer universal that we should demand legislation for them? So in other words, we've got legislation on television because almost 100% of the people watch it. Uh, if the companies hadn't moved on mobiles, we would have had legislation on mobiles because almost 100% of the people use them. Where we've got a problem is that you can't regulate the internet uh, because of the fact that if people don't like your internet regulation, they can move their website to somewhere else. But if you based accessibility requirements on where companies made sales, then you could do a lot more. Most organizations that are of any size in this country operate under a license. You can only sell booze under a license, sell insurance under a license, provide banking services under a license, be a major retailer of food under a sell electronic goods. For, for one reason or another, most things that, that we buy uh, get sold to us under a license. So if a condition of license was that you had to make your website accessible, we'd be getting a lot closer. But we need to be a lot more forensic instead of just rumbling around doing the rights thing because actually um, the bicycle of Human rights is always mown down by the uh, tank of profit. Okay. Antonio, I know you've got a question. No, uh, we, uh, uh, quite, uh, quite recently, the European Union approved the, the new regulations on, on accessibility uh, in relation to apps uh, and websites. We also have the Marrakesh Treaty. So, uh, we, over the, in the past year, we have interviewed people from the government in Norway, where they have a sort of a, a educative approach to accessibility in business, where they, they, they don't enforce, but they try to educate. What do you think it's, it is the, the role of government and policy makers within the accessibility? Are they there to regulate or are they there to educate? Um, I think that they're there to regulate where there is a clear legal case that something that people need to do is so universally done, like television, shopping, um, telephony, that there is a legal case for the government abridging shareholder value in order to achieve social gain. So it's got to in some way be proportionate. A law that said all digital material has to be accessible to all disabled people would actually put an awful lot of SMEs out of business. So there's just no point in doing that. That's the first thing. So if it's what you call peer normative, and you can set a number on that, you can say if an activity in a country reaches X percent, then we'll legislate. That's the first thing. But the second thing is, is that you can't actually, given the global transmission of digital information, um, legislate, for instance, for the accessibility of websites other than those you create in your own country, like government websites or apps. It's all very well for people who use minority languages like Swedish or Norwegian to say nobody can do anything in Norway or Sweden without this, because the Norwegian and Swedish language markets are not global. They're, they're very local, so that you can legislate that way. But you couldn't say to somebody developing a really good app somewhere in um, a country you hardly knew and say, well, you can't bring that into the UK if you don't make it accessible. What my approach at RNIB is, is exactly the opposite. My approach is to say, stop lobbying. Lobbyists are really expensive people. What you do is you get the app that you really want for blind people, you make it accessible, and you sell the accessibility solution back to the manufacturer, because it's cheaper to manufacture and sell solutions than it is to pay lobbyists. Okay. Uh, 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 go on. Uh, well, uh, so, sometimes when I do our work for Access Chat, I try to, to identify people working in the area of accessibility and digital inclusion in many different countries to, to see you know, if, if th there's a potential of bringing them to the conversation. And sometimes I found that uh, um, organizations that work on accessibility 
they have websites who are not, let's say, consumer friendly. People are not, uh, will never feel engaged to go to those websites and consume the information that is in there. And then I realized that sometimes they do those websites more for their own community than for the broader community. Don't you think there's something there that needs some work as well? There has been a myth around. So I'm, I went to the very first web accessibility initiative meeting in 1996 in Sofia, Antipolis. I can still remember it, just outside Nice. And the very first meeting I went to, there was a quite robust discussion about whether accessibility damaged aesthetics. Uh, so that if you made something really accessible, it would look dull and boring. Um, that is a totally false understanding of the way aesthetics work. If you think of um, really great works of art, okay, there are some very busy painters like Bruegel, but actually more or less all the best art has got really clean, elegant lines where you've got uh, a good, simple use of maybe six or seven colors. But there, there comes a point with art, just as there comes a point with food, that if you get too many flavors, it just stuff cancels each other out. So I think there's an absolute tie up between accessible, accessibility and aesthetics. But what you need for that are web designers who are not lazy. And from the disability side, you need web designers who've got enough knowledge of aesthetics. Think about it this way. Designing for the web is really difficult because it combines skills that are not naturally put together. So the two most important skills in web design are aesthetics and taxonomy. Very few people study both aesthetics and taxonomy. They usually go down the art and design route, or they go down the philosophy, logic, and taxonomy route, but very few do both. So, uh, I think it is uh, an unusual mixing of skills. Uh, however, uh, the requirement is definitely there because you, you want people to be attractive. Organizations, commercial organizations, obviously have been branding their products for, for centuries now and wish to brand their online presence and, and mar make it marketable and attractive. But equal, equally, the end users want clear functionality. And, and, and what, what we sometimes see, and actually um, quite often I see on websites is that you get either or. What you don't get is the is the the, the mixing of the two. And and my goal is always to try and get something that is both functionally accessible, but also aesthetically pleasing. And you have all of the affordances needed because, from, from my point of view, as someone with dyslexia, I want clear visual affordances uh, that that enable me to be able to use that. And, and, and also to, 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 to pick up on your point, sometimes it may require more than one product to, to enable everyone to access that market because well, I'm the, not, I'm the not needs sure. of people are different. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure about that. I mean, there's been an ideological dispute about whether disabled people should have separate websites or the same. Oh, no, I'm not necessarily talking about separate websites, but in terms of um, products in general. Well, let's go, let's go back to the design question first, because yeah. it raises a fascinating point. One of the really serious problems in web design, which I've come across in my 20 years, is that the web designers are not being properly controlled by the sales department. So you can go onto a lot of websites, and you're not clear what it's there for. I mean, if you, if you want to go onto a commercial website to buy a car, and the website's very good at showing you the cars, but very bad at helping you to buy one. It's a bad website if its purpose is car selling. So our problem over the years has been to say the sales departments 
look, you want to sell this thing, make sure I can buy it. Um, whereas the art school mentality just wants it to look beautiful. Well, looking beautiful isn't going to help sales departments because it, you, you need to pass from PR into sales. I mean, PR is a necessary precondition of sales or marketing is a necessary precondition of sales. But if you don't make the sales, you've just wasted the money. Yeah, uh, I, think, I think that's true. Uh, and, and we certainly see a lot of stuff that is designed uh, and, and over the last few years there's been a trend for flat design and hollow buttons where what you have is an image taking up most of the website and, and the functionality is hidden. Well, from my point of view, that's bad for sales or, or bad for task completion because it may not be that you're trying to sell something, but ultimately all of these websites are offering some kind of, of service or, or something that you need to do. If you are putting the aesthetics over the functionality of being able to do it, then I think you failed in, in what you're trying to achieve. I'm sure. And, and there's, a, there's a mirror image of that in the way that public sector websites, by and large, reflect the concerns of uh, the department that publishes them rather than the citizens that access them. So... One of the really mad things in the past two decades has been uh, the belief by civil servants, which is totally wrong, that you can digitize analog processes. People who would sit and fill out a 32-page analog form are not going to sit and fill out a 32-page online form, particularly if halfway through they get trapped in a box or they drop off or they get told they've been on there 15 minutes and that's all they can have, or all these other absolutely absurd things. I've been pushing for years in the public sector for a hybrid system so that um, if somebody has difficulty filling a form on a website, um, the system immediately puts somebody through to a telephone call center. And when they've solved that problem, the call center rings off. And what we've got at the moment is you can either fill out a form online or you can use a call center, but you haven't got a hybrid system. And hybrid systems would save everybody a lot of time and money. And they're technologically quite possible now. But the government just doesn't seem interested in that. Well, we're actually, so we may not be doing it for, for government and uh, public-facing websites, but this is something that we're active, actively doing for some of our customers in terms of uh, technical support. So we start off with people being able to use the website and then if they get stuck, they can get live help. And that live help isn't necessarily live chat, um, but that they can go from a sort of instant messaging to then to a call. Uh, and and I, actually, I was at our offices, uh, or actually our factory the other, the other week, where we make ticketing machines for, for rail uh, for, the, for the stations. And one of the things we're, we're doing now, aside from putting in hearing loops and, and, <coughs> and, and, and and braille for for the, the the machines themselves is putting in a two-way camera um, to enable people to have, call for help because if they get stuck then they'll get through to a real person that can take over the machine yeah, yeah. Uh, and spit the tickets out yeah yeah so uh, so so that's something we're actively working on um, and and I think that that is going to become more common, but you may not get a live person. What you might get in the next few years is a bot. Yeah. I don't know how much longer we've got, but it seems to me that there's um, one area of information that has been pretty well left behind in, in 20 years that worries me. That is that when... I first joined the Web Accessibility Initiative. The argument really was about what concessions could you screw out of Microsoft, because it was the only game on the block in the mid-90s. There was a bit of IBM, but in the end it was, what was Microsoft prepared to uh, give us in terms of uh, web content accessibility guidelines, WCAG 1, and then painfully later WCAG 2. But what's happened in the last 20 years that hasn't crept up on us, it's been a storm, has been the change from 
average human beings, I don't mean academics, and I don't mean the people of the top 10 in terms of intelligence, but there's been an absolute explosion in the past 20 years through SMS, email, blogs, web publishing, the whole thing, in self-publishing. And the tools that disabled people can use to publish have not uh, been as good as they should be. And it's absolutely essential if people with disabilities are going to stay even in 21st century society. Uh, they've got to be publishers. If you're not a publisher, you're damned. Okay. I think that's, that's a, a really interesting perspective. We often talk about the other side of that, which is the the, the pr proliferation of user-generated content and how actually the platforms should be putting the ability to create the uh, metadata required for accessibility front and center as part of the workflow. So for instance, um, Twitter allows you to create um, image descriptions as part of your uh, Twitter post, but the feature for that is not on by default. Yeah. So therefore you've got to go and look for it, turn it on and, 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 uh, and be actively thinking about it. The feature's not uh, in any way intrusive um, and if they put it on by default people would use it and you would you would uh, actually be able to uh, help more people make more accessible user-generated content. That's really important for blind people because for blind people the elephant in the room right is description. Uh, description isn't a natural gift which is why we prize our novelists and to a lesser extent are journalists so much because they can actually look at something and describe it. Um, not even the qualified teachers and blind children get taught how to describe, which I think is a great shortcoming. And while that art has moved on in audio description in a quite big way for uh, linear broadcasting, for, for television and, and for movies, because there's so much printing of staff, static graphics, you can't expect it to be so widespread. But I, I do feel that emphasizing the authorial intention and giving the author respons the responsibility for describing the author's own picture selection is really important because nobody actually knows as well as the author why the picture's there uh, and what the author wants you to see in the picture. The problem about a picture is that if you took a picture, say, of an average street scene, you wouldn't know unless the text or the author tells you that the author is interested in um, the colours of the shop signs rather than the design of the pavement, I mean, or the, or the costumes of the people. Um, you just need to know why the picture's there. And authorial intention, I think, is immensely important and getting people to take responsibility for that. Um, that saves an awful lot of intermediary labor. In fact, for authors not to describe their own pictures is fundamentally a cost shift from the producer to the consumer. Antonio, you had a final follow-up question? Um, I was on a, on a webinar from a, organized by, by a, a main uh, so, social media application where they, they work with analytics for, for with marketing purposes and they were talking about bringing image recognition in order to allow brands to know when someone is uh, mentioning or, or posting a picture about them. Uh, we, we see this type of developing, developments coming to market, but they somehow they seem to, to take time because they need huge data sets of information in order to be accurate. What do you think is the role, will be the role of image recognition within accessibility and to help people to navigate in the web? It's a very limited use. I mean, the, the, the main investment in image recognition is to use automated systems to um, locate pornography. I mean, that, that's where all the investment has been, uh, particularly people who want their sites to be child safe. But the problem with image recognition is that it, it only to a very limited extent a bit like a picture of a criminal outside a police station where you've got a line drawing 
it can tell you what, but what a consumer needs when there's a graphic in a file is to know why. I mean, I can be reading a text and somebody can write a description next to a picture and say, picture of um, Neil Millican, right? If that picture isn't captioned, Neil Millican, uh, accessibility expert for Atos, because that designation of him hasn't been in the text. All that's been in the text is uh, there are a few key accessibility experts. Um, the caption tells you why rather than just what. And uncaptioned pictures give you a real problem because even if they do tell you what, the text may not make it obvious to you why. Uh, and therefore, you don't, get a, you don't get a full description. And this is particularly true outside ordinary sales and um, commercial activity. When you get into sort of uh, artistic publication and people's photographs, what is it in a family photograph you want people to know about? We're talking about the street scene that I mentioned earlier again. A photograph has so many different things in it. What you want is the author to tell you what it is it's been put in there for, rather than just a very long object description which takes too long. I mean, one of the real problems, if we're bringing this to an end, uh, for blind and partially sighted people is simply getting to what they need fast enough. Um, I got into real bad trouble about eight years ago for saying that blind people could read a screen full of web information much slower than a sighted person who could just scan it immediately and see what he wanted, like in, a, in the flicker of an eye. But one of the problems for blind people is that they can't get to the stuff they need and process it fast enough to be competitive. So what authors need to help us with, and you can use tools for this as well, though some of them are pretty primitive, is to get us where we need to go uh, quicker than we currently can. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's absolutely... True, and, and, and you know, so I, I see that with JAWS, and you cycle through the headers, give people put the heading information in um, as a way of, of getting quickly through that information. We have reached the end of our time, Kevin. It's been a fascinating chat. I always